Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this Follow Monitor User Spotlight series. Today we have Dr. Robert Judson Torres, uh, Assistant Professor at the University of Utah and the Hansman Cancer Institute. Uh, just that you know, our goal with this Spotlight series is for you to hear directly from your peers within multiple different research areas and applications about how they are using quantitative lifestyle imaging data in their research. Um, my name is Lisa Bodley. I'm the Communication Manager here at Face Holographic Imaging, and I will be your host for today. Just before we, we jump in, I have a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, this webinar is recorded, so you will receive the recording after the live event as well. And in your control panel, you see there is a little question box. So please feel free at any point during the presentation to write a question to, to Robert. And we will have time at the end to, to answer those questions. And second, I will just briefly take around three minutes to introduce the Holo Monitor Lifestyle Analysis System to you. Uh, it's non-invasive technology and application. For those of you who have not met it before, maybe that will answer the one or other question already in those three minutes. All right, very quickly, this is the system. Uh, for those of you who have not seen it before, the Holo Monitor is a lifestyle imaging system based on digital holographic microscopy. And the software can record images and quantify the daily aspects of a cell. Uh, however, without the use of any labels. The results come directly, therefore, from the cells living their like, happy cell life inside the incubator. And Holo Monitor is even more cell-friendly than that. And I just quickly show you in the technology how that comes. As I said, Holo Monitor is based on digital holography. And uh, how that works is that we have a low-power laser that goes into the back of the system that's split, in, that's split into two. One is a reference beam and one is a sample beam that will go through our cell sample. When it goes through the cell sample, it doesn't affect it in any way. However, it causes a light phase shift, which is what we are quantifying. So when the light passes through the cells and then meets again with the reference beam, uh, the hologra a hologram is created. And that is our base data. Uh, with the computer and the, the software we have from the hologram, we can reconstruct digitally those cell images. That's why it's called digital holography. And as I said earlier already, this hologram, that is our raw data. That's um, the left-hand side image you see. And that is used to calculate that light phase shift. And in because we can calculate basically in every single pixel of the image, the thickness of the cells, um, the software can recreate images both in 2D and in 3D. So when you look at those two images here, um, sort of the blue is the background, and then we see um, with the scale on the left-hand side of each, of each image, how thick the cells are, both 2D and 3D. So the colors here are representative of the thickness of the cell. And of course, it's not only pretty images, we want the data. So once we have those images, the um, analysis begins with cell identification. And as holography uh, images or holographic images contain data about the thickness of the cell, the software can then determine what is cell and what is background. And it can draw the cell boundaries with a very high accuracy. And once we've identified the cells, well, that's when we then pull all the data. So even a single cell image, or even a single cell, gives us a lot of data. For example, 30 different morphological parameters. If we have an image, we can get data on a single cell or its population. And then if we have a multiple of images in a time-lapse movie, we can even see what happens to the cells over time. So in the animation, you see a cell dividing. So we can have a look at cells both tracking their movements over time. We can have a look at uh, their cell morphology. Like here in the cell division, the um, optical volume of the cell dropped, as we can see here. And we can study cell fate, um, studying cell cycle links, for example. So. That was already a lot like a lot of data, and that's like what we always say. You can get multiple results from the same experiment with holographic uh, microscopy. And speaking of results, that is that is my cue to hand over to you, Robert. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. 
Um, maybe a couple of words first um, uh, about Robert. Um, or do you want to take that yourself? Uh, you can go for it. Yeah, I, I go for it. Um, so yeah, um, Robert, Justin Torres, um, you have a long-standing interest in transcriptional reprogramming of mammalian cells, right? First, um, pursuing that interest as a graduate student at the University of California, where um, your work on transcriptional programming in skin cells enabled you to establish an independent research program. And today, Robert's lab is located at the Hans Mann Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. And well, your award-winning research has been published in several journals, um, focusing on melanoma and the transcriptional programs in human melanocytes. There you got that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great work. Uh, I want to hear more now. So the, the stage is yours. I will um, hand over the um, screen to you, Robert, and then you're all good to go. Are you able to see a full screen slide here? Yes, um, I leave the stage fully to you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, actually, uh, Lisa, one last question. Can you see my cursor moving on the screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Great, well, thank you for inviting me to give this webinar. It's a delight to share some of our recent research with all of you. Um, one of the uh, current sort of big questions of my lab is, trying to look for and understand the molecular differences between a benign skin tumor, frequently referred to as a mole, uh, and the most deadly skin cancer, uh, which is known as melanoma. Um, and in particular today, I'd like to talk about our use of the whole monitor, um, so digital holographic cytom cytometry, and how it has recently helped us unlock a key molecular distinction between um, these two types of skin tumors. So the cell type we're going to be talking about today is the human epidermal melanocyte. Um, I am uh, showing you here in this cartoon, this is a, a cross-section of human skin. Um, and key things to know here, just a sort of basic map, is we've got two main layers. The epidermis is this darker pink layer in the top. Uh, this large pink layer in the bottom is the dermis. Uh, these sort of protrusions, these are our hair follicles. And in this zoom in, uh, here, this little blue cell, this is the human epidermal melanocyte. So it is in the epidermis right on the junction of the two layers. Um, I love these, these cells. They are absolutely beautiful. Here's some um, uh, immunofluorescence imaging of human skin in our lab where we've got uh, green and yellow or staining for markers of these melanocytes. All the nuclei, nuclei are in red. And you can see this beautiful um, sort of squid-like dendritic morphology of these cells. Um, and they, they really do, they reach out and they, they, they each touch um, dozens of different other cell types uh, or other cells in the skin, including multiple different cell types. Um, they're not only beautiful cells, they're actually quite friendly. That's been captured here in this beautiful um, uh, 3D reconstruction of serial electron, electron microscopy conducted out of Rockefeller. Again, of human skin, now the melanocytes in purple, keratinocytes, which make up the, the bulk of our skin um, are in um, blue here. And captured in this little black box, you can see that you know, melanocytes reaching out and, and holding hands with that, that keratinocyte. And that's what they do with each of these dendrites. They're, they're, they're like a very protective teacher um, holding the hands of a bunch of different children in the classroom. And they do protect those cells. That's, that, that is what they do, and that interaction is very important. Um, and so these are the pigment-producing cells of our skin. They produce a pigment called melanin. And through those interactions of those the dendrites touching the keratinocytes, they pump pigment into the keratinocytes, which again are the majority cell type in our skin. And this melanin forms a bit of a, a hat or a shield above the nuclei of those keratinocytes and it pre pre um, prevents, um, protects against UV induced mutagenesis in, in that context. Um, and so this sort of pumping of pigment into keratinocytes is the, uh, the responsible for the, the main known functions of human epidermal melanocytes. Uh, which is to give us our, our baseline skin tone, as well as a more dynamic um, uh, pigment response, um, which is our UV-induced tanning response. Now, uh, human epidermal melanocytes and pigmentation in general is also associated with a variety of different diseases and disorders, either the root cause of these disorders or um, otherwise associated with. And I've listed a number of them here, and you can see they present in a myriad of different ways. Um, and you know, not only is there um, uh, differences of, of, of pigmentation um, 
the, the associated disorders across the different disorders. But even within one disease, for example, here again, melanoma, uh, which is a deadly skin cancer, uh, this is really an, an umbrella term that's capturing a wide variety of different types of skin tumors. So nine different uh, uh, types of malignant melanoma shown here in this bottom row, uh, which says invasive, but also a wide variety of different types of benign tumors, borderline tumors, um, and even rapidly growing but non-invasive tumors, which can, can either stand alone or be precursors to the malignant disease. And one of the things my lab's really interested in is what drives this sort of heterogeneity of different melanocytic tumors, right? Um, I, th I think when we first um, started to sequence the genome of all these tumors, the expectation was going to be that each one of these came with its own unique genetic signature. Uh, there are certainly associations with some genetic signatures in some of these subtypes, but so far we have not seen a one-to-one -one mapping of the um, genetic changes and then the type of tumor that's presented. So another possibility is that melanocytes themselves on a transcriptional or epigenetic level are, are heterogeneous. And certainly lots of reason to believe that that would be true. We just need to look at the beautiful diversity across the animal kingdom to appreciate that not only are pigment producing cells very diverse from species to species, but even within a species, right, we've got different patterns of pigmentation. And although it may not be as obvious as a zebra or a tiger, that's true of human beings as well, right? So different areas of our anatomy have different levels of pigmentation. Some of these are very distinct patterns that occur during development, such as our, our volar regions being lighter than other areas of our limbs. Um, others are the responses to um, fluctuations in hormones or, um, or damage to the skin. Uh, even the pro proximity to blood vessels can change pigmentation. Um, what's more, we have melanocytes in areas of our body that are, are not um, exposed to, to sunlight, or hopefully are not exposed to sunlight, including our brain, our lungs, and our heart. And we really just don't have a great idea of, um, of sort of how melanocytes are different from area to area in our body, um, and how these melanocytes might have different functions. Um, but we do have reason to believe that if we want to understand how the melanocyte heterogeneity might contribute to disease, that we would need to study it in human. And so I think, it, you know, just looking at these three pictures, it's perhaps no surprise that regulation, purpose, and presentation of pigmentation really differs across species. So there are about 650 different genes that have um, been characterized as having a phenotype-genotype relationship related to pigmentation. And when these genes have um, been um, studied, this is a meta-analysis published a few years ago, and asking whether those genotype-phenotype relationships are consistent across different organisms or they diverge across different organisms. Um, what this pie chart shows you is that for most of these genes, the phenotype-genotype relationship is unique for the species. And there's really only a handful of pigmentation genes that have the same relationship across the three species studied here, which are zebra, fat, fish, mouse, and human. And so one of the main um, objectives in my lab recently, um, as mentioned, we, we are coming out of Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. Um, and our recent objectives are to ask whether we can characterize the heterogeneity of human epidermal melanocytes, and then ask how this heterogeneity can contribute to the heterogeneity of disease. Um, and for us specifically, we're first looking at melanoma. Uh, Utah has the unfortunate distinction of having the highest rate of melanoma um, in the United States, um, and we certainly like to get out on these foothills as much as we can. So uh, we have a vested interest in understanding how to better um, identify early and, and prevent this disease. Um, and so we've recently published that it turns out that human epidermal melanocytes are heterogeneous uh, and they're also uh, fairly unique um, to, to the human. Um, very briefly, the way we conducted the study was to conduct single cell RNA sequencing um, from different anatomic locations through human development and into adulthood. Um, we had 37 total skin samples. This is all healthy skin. And we had a pipeline where we could disassociate the epidermis from the dermis. Uh, get a single cell suspension, use a fax-based enrichment to then select out the melanocytes that make a, they're a very small percentage of the cells in the skin, about 2%, and then conduct single cell RNA sequencing in order to be able to characterize the differences. And I'm not going to go into the details of the study today, just show you the punchline, which is that the same donor um, could, could show at least three different distinct types of human epidermal melanocytes. Uh, that includes a more pigmented um, type that is more differentiated that we call C-type. It includes a stem cell type that is less pigmented 
less differentiated and rich for a stem cell program. And also includes a, a third type that really is neither differentiated nor, or nor stem cell, but seems to be its own um, type of population that is also apigmented. Um, and in parallel with, with these studies conducted at um, pretty much exactly the same time was a, another beautiful study that was just published using an entirely different set of techniques to ask similar questions, human skin, and they reached a, a very comparable um, um, set of conclusions. So it's been really exciting. Both studies have landed on this same idea that we've got at least these three different types of melanocytes in our skin, um, the function of which and how they contribute to disease, we currently just have no idea. Um, and so the, the, the hypothesis that, um, or the question we want to ask then is how does this heterogeneity of the healthy melanocytes, does it underpin heterogeneity of disease, right? So if we have two different types of melanocytes depicted here in blue and green, and each of them were to receive an oncogenic mutation, does that alter the, the type of um, melanoma that ultimately grows out? Um, and we had a lot of uh, substantial barriers to be able to ask this question. Um, first, there are no obviously home run model systems to be able to ask this question. So what do I mean by that? Well, as part of our analysis in, in the study, um, I just mentioned, although I'm not showing you here, we did compare the transcriptomes of the human melanocytes to other model systems of, of pigment producing cells uh, such as mouse. And for these um, unique type uh, human um, epidermal melanocytes, we, we did not see um, comparable cell populations in the other model systems. Again, not a huge surprise when it comes to pigmentation, we're very different from mice, um, but it, it does mean that um, we, we need a system where we can ask this question. We also found that there are in vitro conditions that we have for culture in human melanocytes, and they really select for um, one particular, particular transcriptional subtype and against the rest, so that makes that a more difficult model system to work with as well. Um, and we, we um, wanted to ask questions about transforma transformation and immortalization, right? And that means if that's the question, it can't be our tool, which means uh, we can't take um, primary lines or, or tumor lines that have already been transformed and propagated in culture and use them as a way of asking about the molecular barriers to transformation itself. Um, and so for solutions, um, again, we have this pipeline of taking, um, uh, getting short-term primary cell culture from melanocytes. Um, essentially the way this works is that when there is uh, an, an amputation uh, in our hospital, we are able to access um, those, those limbs and get large specimens of fresh, healthy patient matched skin from different anatomic locations, and then use our facts-based selection to pull out those melanocytes. But again, um, they're about 2% of the skin, and we want to keep them in very short-term culture because we know we, we are losing the information we care about the longer we keep them in culture. Um, and so that's a solution for the model system. Um, and really, you know, why I'm speaking here today is we found that quantitative phase imaging, specifically digital holographic cytometry, has been a wonderful solution for these other barriers and that it allows us to conduct single cell longitudinal tracking of each cell um, and also to classify the different transcriptional states um, via the cell's morphology. And so in the absence of, of labels and um, other techniques we can't really use in primary cell culture. Um, and so we, we, we published a bit on this at this point um, and uh, sort of two categories of those publications. Um, so Lisa mentioned earlier all of these um, parameters, we call them features, but essentially the, the different morphologic uh, metrics that one can measure from each individual cell um, that comes along with using um, digital holographic cytometry. Um, and we, we have found that we can um, use those features combined with machine learning to really create these high accuracy label free classifiers. <clears throat> and that's been uh, really exciting. We've done that in a number of different studies. Um, but the other thing that's popped up um, as well that's been incredibly useful for us are really what we just call the plug and play basics of the AppSuite system. Um, and so AppSuite is the, the name of the software that, that uh, leads um, one of those studies was published in 2018 in Cancer Cell, where we found a relationship between a, a known tumor suppressor and invasion that was previously um, uh, unknown. And today I'm going to talk about a, a, a similar story where um, this sort of analysis really uh, cracked the nut uh, for a, um, on a, a particular conundrum in the field on, on how um, there's a difference between a mole and a melanoma. Um, and so again, the question here is to molar to melanoma. So going back to our chart of different types of melanocytic tumors of the skin. Um, 
shown here in red are an acquired nevus, more commonly referred to as a mole, right? These are all very common. I'd wager most people in, in the audience here probably personally know a mole one way or the other. Um, and they're usually totally fine, right? They, they do not present any sort of danger to the, to, to the patient. Um, and then there's a melanoma, right? Which um, can be very uh, deadly. And you know what's something I always found interesting is that there's a very specific driver mutation called BRAF B600E that drives about um, half of all melanomas and about 90% of all um, nevi or moles. And we don't really have a great idea of what makes the difference there. There is an existing model, um, one of oncogene-induced senescence, which basically says when a melanocyte acquires BRAF B600E, it first drives unchecked proliferation. And then over time, for, for really uncharacterized um, reasons, it will switch to also driving the tumor suppressor CDKN2A, which results in a irreversible senescence. Now, I'll just briefly say that this model has been called into question multiple times with multiple systems over the years, um, and specifically the whether or not there's any role for CDKN2A and whether this is truly senescence has, has really been what's, what's been questioned. Um, but there hasn't really been an alternative model that's been proposed, and, and that's something we're curious about. And so now that we know that there are these different types of melanocytes in skin, we did wonder whether um, if a different type of melanocyte acquired the same mutation, it would drive a different um, skin tumor. Um, now, before we get into that question, I will just say that our study uh, did not really answer a question of whether or not these cells were plastic, meaning they could switch in between these different transcriptional states, because everything we looked at, this was just a, a snapshot um, of, of the cells in the skin. Uh, so that was the first question uh, we asked. So we, we take fresh biopsy of normal skin, we pull out the melanocytes, and we use different um, uh, growth conditions in short-term culture, and then perform transcriptomic profiling to see if we could identify cells in these different states. And all I'm really showing you here is that here is one type of media where we have a strong enrichment for the differentiation program. So that'd be these yellow cells from skin. And here we have a strong enrichment for the MSC program. That'd be these blue cells. And importantly, this isn't a selection for, it's actually reprogramming the cells. They will switch back and forth between these states um, pretty much overnight if, if we switch the media. Um, and so now we could really ask this question, if we take these two different cell types, or the same cells in these two different transcriptional states, and introduce an inducible oncogene, in this case, BRAF B600E, does it cause uh, different effects on, on the cells, right? Will the oncogene act differently? Um, and this was a pretty straightforward um, um, polar monitor experiment for us. So again, we start with, with the skin, we introduce the transgene. Um, we don't need to have very many cells to conduct this experiment. Um, 1.5 million um, might sound like a lot, but you know, if you're generally dealing with in vitro systems, you can get as many cells as you want. This is you know, pretty much where we are maxing out. Um, plate them down in six well plates, um, and then they conducted a 72-hour growth analysis. On the left, you see a Western just to show that our uh, inducible system works. So it's induced by doxycycline exposure, and the more we add, the more of the oncogene gets expressed, activation of downstream um, signaling molecules. Um, and what we see is that um, uh, in blue, this has been shown in the literature before, in the differentiated conditions, um, what I'm plotting if you, if you, for you here is a growth rate is calculated by the, um, uh, the HOLA monitor. And the more docs we add, the cells um, divide less and less and less, right? And so this is this oncogene induced growth arrest. What was exciting to see is that if the cells were in the other transcriptional state, these exact same cells, uh, the oncogene instead acts like a bona fide oncogene, induces more and more and more proliferation. Um, the uh, next question that uh, we want to ask then is this um, proliferative arrest versus um, um, proliferation, uh, is it reversible or is it irreversible? And again, this was a question that was made very easy for us to ask with a whole monitor. Uh, same experimental setup, except now everything is starting in the growth arrest conditions, 48 hours growth analysis. And then afterwards, for one of those two plates, we pull a quick switch of the media to push them into the stem uh, like transcriptional state, um, and then monitor them for another 72 hours. Um, and, and here we're able to capture this beautiful switch in phenotype, right? So you can see the circles and the squares in this case. Um, again, we're looking at cell number. They are flatlined for the first 96 hours. We change the media, looking at the same, exact same cells, and we see the, the same cells pop right back into cell cycle and start dividing um, when we switch into the stem cell media.
Now, when we, we went to submit this, um, we, we, I think very rightfully, got some, uh, some pushback from, from reviewers, right? They were really challenging some dogma in the field here. Um, and one of the questions that they had is, is the arrest that we are causing with the, with the oncogene, is it sustained and complete, right? They wanted to know, well, perhaps they haven't been arrested long enough, or perhaps not all the cells are arrested. And, and here is really where it was uh, quite fun and, and, um, and, and useful to, to use the holo monitor. Um, because again, it's not toxic, right? And so we conducted the same experiment, but instead of you know two or three days in the growth arresting conditions, we kept them there for a month. And during that month, we could take the the plate in and out of the incubator and um, measure over 48 hour um, um, windows to make sure that all the cells were arrested um, and were not had not been growing for weeks before we pulled the the media switch. Um, so for example, on the left here, here from days 14 to 16, this is just showing um, growth in, in one section of the plate. And we've got the differentiate conditions. Um, the, the cells are growing fine. We add in the oncogene and they are arrested. And we were able to scan the plate and make sure all of these cells had stopped growing prior to, at day 30, switching the media, um, putting them in that stem cell state, and then seeing them pop back into cell cycle. And so uh, what that tells us, right, is it gives us a new model um, where uh, the senescence is um, not senescence, but is actually a reversible arrest. Um, and that the BRAF, the effect of the BRAF B600 oncogene on the cells is really dependent on the environment and transcriptional state of those cells. Of course, we need mechanism, right? And, and, and here is a, a quick example of where um, the whole monitor uh, you know, we, we really discovered something exciting and fun that I'm very confident to say that we, we would not have seen uh, if we weren't using this system. And again, this came from using the, 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 the App Suite software, where with the click of a button, we can ask questions that we weren't thinking to ask. Um, and here I'm showing you two bits of data from the same experiment. Uh, we've got cell number, uh, the different colored lines here, we're adding more and more of the oncogene, and you can see a drop in cell number, right? The more oncogene we add, these are in differentiated conditions, the less these cells divide. And uh, what one of my students noticed is that if we look at the optical volume, we're reporting here is dry mass um, per cell, uh, we actually see the an inverse of, of, of what um, the effect on proliferation. So the more oncogene we add, the larger and larger those cells got. And that seemed... Um, at face value, a little bit odd to me. Um, this is not what we were expecting. Um, and, and it could very easily ask the, uh, the student who was looking at this to go back and show me the videos. Um, and you know what she saw um, alarmed me. I hope it alarms you. You're seeing the cell at the center trying to divide. And what we see instead of the classic division you might expect um, is a, a tripolar division followed by a refusion event, right? Uh, again, nothing that we were expecting to see um, and a bit alarming, but that caused us to wonder whether or not that this is not a G0, G1 arrest as, as, as happens in other cell types with BRAF B600E, but another type of growth arrest. Um, and through a variety of different methods, that's exactly what we demonstrated, right, is that the cells that the melanocytes that are growth arrested have more and more DNA content. Um, and um, uh, shown here with the facts profiles, Again, more and more um, of the oncogene, the more cells we have in G2M are even greater than foreign growth, growth rest. Now, this is really interesting, right? Because it showed us that in vitro, um, we would expect that BRAF E600E driven growth arrest would be associated with multiple copies of the genome. Uh, and so I asked the der dermatopathologist in my department, which I am not, hey, does this sound like anything you might have seen before? Do melanocytic nevi or, or moles, are they associated with, with multiple copies of the genome? And they just you know, looked at me like I was a little bit crazy and said, yeah, no, ab absolutely, that, that is very well known. Um, it's one of the things we look for in nevi, right? And so here's a picture of, of a patient's nevus um, that's been sectioned, and what the arrows are pointing to are cells with two copies of the genome, three copies of the genome, four copies of the genome, right? So an observation that's been in the clinic for a long time, but not actually explained by our, our in vitro models um, that that uh, our, our studies um, you know really revealed to us. Uh, and here again, if we take a fresh nevus and, and pull the melanocytes out and plate them down, again we find that about 75% of the cells in those in those nevi are multinucleated. 
Um, and so um, I, I know I'm going a bit over time here, so I'll be very brief um, and we we'll just point people to the recent eLife paper where we used a number of different methods then to, um, to follow up on this observation. But very briefly, we found that if we compare the transcriptomes of nevi versus melanoma, the most consistently changed tran um, transcript was a microRNA called MIR211, which was high in the nevi and low in the melanoma. This was also true in our in vitro system. We found that its uh, most consistent and downregulated target was a gene that is involved in G2M called aurorokinase B. And indeed, if the microRNA is around, all right, well, let's start this way. If, the, if MIR211 is not expressed, then BRAF V6 synergy causes an induction of this gene. If the microRNA is expressed, it caps that induction. Um, and again, using uh, the, the M4 system, we're able to show that we could completely rescue this growth arrest you see here when we induce the oncogene. Um, compare the red bar here to the two red here, either by um, uh, inhibiting the microRNA itself or overexpressing the rorokinase B. Uh, this, this turns out to be such a strong association is that if we just use these microRNAs um, and their expression levels as a way to blindly diagnose uh, nevi from melanoma over multiple large cohorts from about six or seven different universities, we're able to do so with a really high sensitivity. So this is an area under the rock curve of 90% sensitivity and specificity shown here. Uh, so it is, is really quite consistent. Uh, and so that gives us um, now a molecular mechanism for determining the switch. And what we think is really excited about this is that it, it is a new proposed model for how a mole forms. Um, and then this is a dynamic arrest where the uh, epidermal melanocytes can switch between a stem cell and a more differentiated state. Um, and then the BRAF oncogene is either causing unchecked growth or mitotic failure, depending on the transcriptional state. And importantly, that can toggle after the oncogene is introduced. And molecularly, this seems to be governed by an axis between a rare kind of speed and near 211. It's exciting because there are a lot of unexplained clinical phenomena from the previous model that are explained by this model. Uh, those include nevus eruption, so a patient can acquire hundreds of new nevi in a short period of time, or the nevi they have grow. Um, and that is uh, not explained through a senescence model. It is explained through a dynamic arrest model. Um, nevus recurrence is when a nevus is mostly removed, but a few cells got missed and it can grow back, um, same idea. Um, and nevus growth in the first place. And Elisa, I'm actually going to ask you, um, I've, I think I've clearly missed time this. I have a, a section now on also um, uh, looking at DHC morphological feature-based classification, which I'm happy to get into. Um, but if time is an issue here, I can also save it for another webinar. What do you think? I think Rob, you just go for it. Okay. Great. So um, our, our next big question then, right, is we know in vitro the different conditions that result in the switching between the MSC and the differentiated transcriptional state, um, which align with the unchecked growth or the mitotic failure state. But we don't really know the answer of, of in, in skin, in sort of the human condition, right? What, what, is, what is that trigger? Um, and so what we'd like, we'd like to know what that induces the MSC state. Uh, and we want to know that so we can determine whether we can block it, right? And this is essentially a chemopreventative measure for both um, mole formation as well as melanoma formation. And for this, we're, we're using our, our toolkit that we published on a few times now, which is this DHC morphologic feature-based classification. And, and the idea here is that we see these um, in different conditions. Um, and, and this is unrelated to what I was just showing you, just an example, right? We've got um, melanoma cells that are not treated or treated with small molecules that trigger different types of programmed cell death. And it's easy to appreciate, I believe, um, the morphologic distinctions between each of these states. Um, and so um, what we'd like to do is to see if we can train classifiers that can tell us with single cell resolution what transcriptional state a cell is in based upon the, these morphologic features. And so very much as, as Lisa presented earlier, the way we do it is taking time-lapse patient images, um, segment those objects, and then track them um, over time. Um, and and we, we then need to train um, classifiers one way or the other to be able to, um, to, to then classify a cell into each of these different states. And we do that using the different um, uh, morphologic features provided by the system. And this is a, a correlation table. This is where we always start. If we are comparing um, just an, an entire data set, for example, four different conditions, how similar are the metrics from um, 
is how, how similar are each of the morphologic metrics to each other, right? Where blue, they're being very similar or they're very correlated, red being they're very anti-correlated, and white being they're not correlated. Um, and you use this as a first step to look for these correlation blocks, as we call them. You can see a number of them, right? And that allows us to essentially choose and eliminate any feature that's giving us redundant information. Oops. And once we've done that, we can then ask whether there are morphologic features that allow us to distinguish between the four different states or however many states we care about. And this doesn't have to be machine learning. I, I love this example we published a few years ago in Applied Sciences um, because it just shows how, uh, to me, it kind of shows the logic of what machine learning can do when it's very complicated. But if it's not that complicated, what well, we can just do by eye. Um, and in this case, we are plotting and for each of these four conditions is these violin plots. Um, the, the morphologic features of optical thickness, volume, phase shift, and box length for each of these four conditions, and then just by eye making a cutoff for classification. So for example, here we're saying um, if X is greater than 5.7, um, we will call that treatment with this particular compound. If it's less, we go over here, and now we've drawn a line with optical volume, call things that are rest and treated, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, we find that more times than not, we can actually just use a by eye sort of version of this in order to create a pretty high accuracy classifier. In the cases where that's not possible, that's where we do move to machine learning, specifically linear discriminant analysis classification. And, and really, it's, it's, it's the exact same logic, just a lot more complicated, right? In this case, there's a lot more than four features. Um, and um, they're basically the most variable of them are being combined together into individual LDA components. And so then we can create these 3D spaces that incorporate all of the different variable features and, and use that to classify. Um, and so our work in progress at the moment is to train one of these DHC morphologic feature-based classifiers um, to, look, to conduct a phenotype switch screen, right? And so we want to be able to screen for small molecules that causes a differentiated melanocyte to switch into that more stem-like state, which is the one that is associated with melanoma. Um, and, you know, just to sort of highlight the, the issue here, this is um, not DHC, this is, we've now grown these cells in culture for quite some time, um, which has allowed us to put in a, a fluorescent marker of the state. And you, you can sort of appreciate the, the morphologic differences between the high and cherry high, shown in red, and low states here and that the cells are morphologically distinct, but there is also quite a bit of overlap. Um, and so here's the challenge that we currently you know, see ourselves faced with, which we're, we're doing at the moment, is if we take these cells from one donor and conduct a, um, this LDA analysis, we can get a really high accuracy classifier. You can see the distribution of, of the stem cells versus the differentiated cells, 96.05% accuracy for distinguishing them, that's great. Um, but for this to really work for us, we need this classifier to work across the cells um, of, of any skin donation from any patient. And so we take that same classifier and apply it to a second donor or a th third donor. You can see we, we still have really high accuracy, really high significance, but it's, it's not quite high enough for what we would like to do for being to have confidence for each and every cell in, in that culture and be able to call it as a stem cell or a differentiated cell. Um, and so we, we are um, continuing to train this classifier using more and more donations um, and are, I'm happy to um, sort of discuss the various parameters we're tweaking to, to, to make sure it's not overtrained and, and that it will work with any donation. Um, and, and that's a work in progress. So um, thank you uh, for, for tolerating my going over a little bit here. Um, but in, in conclusion, um, we're talking about the difference between a benign mole and a malignant melanoma. Um, and what we have found is that the oncogene-induced arrest of BRAF B600D in human melanocytes is fully reversible. And we were able to show that quite definitively using the whole monitor uh, precisely because it is label-free and non-toxic, which allowed us to do very long-term imaging. I told you about experiments that went on the order of a month. Um, that the type of growth arrest that is induced by the oncogene is a G2M arrest, not the expected G01 arrest. And that this was something that um, uh, we would not have observed had uh, we didn't have access to the, the, the um, various features provided by the whole monitor and being able to go back to those images. Um, and, you know, basically with a click of the button, you know, able to measure other, other features in the one that we're looking for. Um, and that these uh, two observations together have led to a new model that is consistent with the clinical presentation of moles and melanomas. And that in progress, and hopefully I can tell you about next time, 
uh, is that we are, are training a feature-based classification system using the whole monitor to then screen for molecules that prevent the oncogenic phenotype. And with that, just a, a huge thank you to the people in the lab who conducted this work, um, to our collaborators, to all of our, our funders, and to um, uh, this long and great collaboration with PHI. Uh, and thank you, and with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Was like that was a data-filled presentation, like great. And I, and I hope that we can do another presentation again once you um, train those classifiers. That would be super yeah. interesting to know. Yeah, happy to. Um, nevertheless, I think we just take the time. Um, I'm going to check for um, submitted questions. If you haven't submitted your question yet, um, please feel free to do so. I will have a quick. Look. Maybe why why people have a look. Um, Rob, how how long have you been using actually the Holomonitor system? Can you remember? Um, since I set up the lab, actually. So that would have been we'll call it really early 2015, I guess. Technically late 2014. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I I this this um. This problem of knowing we needed to study very early passage of a rare primary cell, right? Um, I mean, I knew that was going to be an issue to ask the questions we wanted to ask when I set up the lab. Um, and so uh, the the whole monitor was actually one of the, the first purchases of my startup package when I first set up shop at UCSF. It's, it's some years ago now, right? So many, yeah. many more years to come, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. You you said like you you image for like a month, right? Um, have you seen any phototoxic effects on your cells during that time? Yeah, so so to be clear, it's it's um uh, we we will image the experiments can keep going for a month because we no we do don't see any phototoxic effects and we we have looked at that very carefully. Um, we don't see any difference between the areas we image and the areas outside where we're imaging nor do we see any difference between the cells in a well where we did imaging and another well we didn't do any imaging. Um, so, so no, we, ha we haven't seen those, those cytotoxic effects. Um, and you, those, it allows us to do those month-long experiments. It's, it is not straight month-long imaging of the same region of interest, right? We, we are moving around to sort of monitor different areas of the well, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're not really seeing an effect there. Yeah, all right. Um... Could you let us know which uh, type of vessel you use? Like, I guess the cell culture plate. Um, what are you using with the hollow monitor? Yeah, we we we've continued to to use the six hole plates, um, and so that that's uh, seems to be the sweet spot for us in terms of the number of cells that we can get from a donation, and um, you know, the, just sort of the the density that we need to plate them at. Um, so we, we have done experiments um, here and there, so amping up to, to 96 well or, or things in between. Um, but for, for most of our work, um, you know, ours is not a system that we can do that very frequently, just with the cells. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, that. Hmm. How? All right. How often? do you image? Like how many images are you taking? Yeah, great question. So it, that really depends on the um, uh, on, on the particular question of the day, right? So if we really want to ask a question about knowing for sure that these cells are not dividing for a while and then they begin dividing, um, you know, it's important to be able to track the individual cells for that. Um, and when we are looking at melanoma cells and, and others that have, you know, a doubling time in on the order of 18 to 24 hours, um, you know, we really need to be imaging every 15 minutes or so. These primary mm -hmm. melanocytes, even when they are dividing what we would call rapidly, it's still about two divisions a week. Um, and so we, we, we can get away with, um, um, uh, you know, if we image every hour, um, it is rare that we can't track the cells. If we image every 20 or 30 minutes, um, then there's no problem at all. Mm -hmm. um, if we're, we're conducting an experiment that more just has to do with, um, you know, the number of cells 
in a particular state in any given time or the proliferation rate of those cells that doesn't doesn't require single cell tracking. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll, we'll even do every four hours or six hours or something along those lines, right? So it's more just, you know, getting a, a, a sampling of, of a snapshot of the cells at different times of the day or the week um, without really trying to, to, to uh, track them. Yeah. Yeah. So really always depending on what you're interested in, is it more of a sort of, you know, for, for long-term growth or is it specific tracking? Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I hope that answered uh, the question. Um, I, how many, okay, so you mentioned a student. So how many people in your lab are using the Hollow Monitor or the, the, the system? Uh, how, yeah, I guess, how many people are like, how, how are you doing it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so we have we have two of them um, sharing an incubator, um, and you know, I, 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 the the question is asked of is there sort of a steady state for the lab, and, and the truth is there isn't, right? I mean, I had the lab for about four years at UCSF, then I moved to Utah, then COVID hit, we had hiring freeze, all of all of that. So there have been times when it's been very crowded for use, and you know, we we haven't been able to get everybody on it when they've wanted to be on it. Um, generally what's happening though is there's usually one to two main projects in the lab that really lean into the system for what they're doing um, and so it's it's one or two people who are really coordinating using those two machines um, and we, we we do try to reserve one of them right again we, we can't um, we get a little bit of heads up when the experiments start right because we'll, we'll get a notification that there's going to be a surgery soon we know about how long it takes from getting surgery to usable cells um, but you, you know, it's it's hard to um, when you're relying on primary donations for your cells to you know fully coordinate. So we try to leave one free for um, the the experiments that come from those primary cell donations, and and then another one that just sort of have a calendar sign up system for. Yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds like a sweet also like a sweet spot of you know share, sharing is caring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's sense, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe a question for from my side. Uh, of course, naturally, we at PHI are interested. What do you like most about the system? Oh, well, I, I hope I highlighted some of that here. Um, I, I will say the um, there there is so a few things, right? So there there are things that I would say I like most because they're just absolutely critical for what we do, right? And and that is the the label free and single cell nature of it. Um, Right, the, and I guess non-toxic. You know, all of that's kind of roped in there, right? It, it enables us to to watch these primary cells that we only have a few of, and you know, monitor the sort of um, distribution of their phenotypes and morphologies over time. Right. Um, I, I think that, in, you know, I'm not sure if I, I did a great job of highlighting this in, in my one of my earlier slides. There, where I was comparing, you know, our, our classification attempts versus, um, you know, I was calling the plug and play. But mm -hmm. you know, when you introduce the the app suites, um, you know that that really made really opened up the ability to um, uh, just just the just the ease of use for for new people in the lab, right? So, for example, that student I mentioned, um, who um, you know that was a rotation student. Um, actually, I don't think she even joined the lab. She's not there in the paper, but she didn't ultimately join the lab, right? So she was with us for three months, and during that time, ran a few of these experiments. Um, you know, noted a discrepancy that she assumed was her mistake, but turned out to be something biological that was really interesting, right? And then we were able to go back to the images and say, oh, wow, that, that's not what we're expecting, All right? So, um, you know, I, I think that, that that interface, which includes both this, the setup and the data analysis, um, you know, I, I really like about the system, for sure. Yeah, that's, uh, I will give back that feedback to the team, uh, but of sure. course, we're always interested in hearing. Um, I don't see any more questions uh, right now, so I think we just wrap it uh, up here. But if there are any more questions coming, please feel free to, to reach out. And um, yeah. I will coordinate also giving those questions um, to, to Robert. And with that, I, I think the last thing that remains for me to say is thank you, Robert, for joining us today. And uh, for the audience, you will uh, do us a great favor and helping us in uh, filling out the survey to uh, let us know what we can do better. Um, by the way, there's also a free download uh, of uh, Rob's latest uh, publication as well as our product brochure. So if you want to have a look at that. Um, and otherwise, please get in touch anytime with us at uh, PHI.
Um, thank you so much for attending. And I guess I see you at the next user spotlight or at next the next webinar with Rob, when we have a look at the classifiers. <laughs> All right. Um, see you next time, I guess. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. <laughs>